Welcome everyone to LBNL's webinar of our recently released report entitled A Framework for Organizing Current and Future Electric Utility Regulatory and Business Models. Uh, first off, we would very much like to thank DOE's Office of Strategic Programs for funding this work. I'm Peter Cappers, and along with my co-author Andy Satchwell, we will be presenting a summary version of the report for you today. Our plan is to get through the webinar material in 30 to 35 minutes, and that should leave ample time at the end uh, for a question and answer session. Um, as such, please submit your questions through the chat function to the left of your screen. Um, I'll be collecting those throughout the webinar, and then we'll be going through them at the end. With that, let's get started. So I'm going to first provide some introductory comments to help explain our motivation for undertaking this research, then move on to discuss utility motivations under traditional cost of service regulation via a framework that we've created for identifying electric utility regulatory and business models. Andy is then going to take over and identify changes that utilities and their regulators could consider within this framework, which incrementally or fundamentally alter the utility's business model. Lastly, Andy is going to discuss the broader implications of this research, what kinds of transition strategies might be employed to achieve the changes that are discussed, and the types of future, future research that LBNL is considering that would leverage this work. As all of you are intimately aware, you know, at present there are a number of trends confronting electric utilities that are really shaping the regulatory and business environment and in some cases are really going to accelerate some pretty dramatic change in the electric industry. For example, energy efficiency investments are likely in many states to continue to offset the majority of the forecasted electric load growth. Cost of distributed energy resources as well as automation and control technologies are declining quite steadily and resulting in pretty large increases in penetration. When taken together, these factors are contributing in some jurisdictions to stagnant if not declining electric sales, which has the potential to put downward pressure on utility revenue growth in the near term. In addition, many utilities are facing the prospects of large capital investments in generation, transmission, and especially distribution system upgrades, which is putting upward pressure on utility cost growth. Many regulators, utilities, customer groups, and other stakeholders are seriously reevaluating regulatory approaches and roles in light of the potential for some pretty dramatic adverse financial implications for electric utilities in the context of this environment. Now there's a considerable volume of research and advocacy targeted at defining, analyzing, and in some cases even promoting alternative utility business models and regulatory incentives. Such activities can really be best categorized by each of the stakeholder groups and their unique perspectives. First, we've got utilities and especially utility industry investors who are chiefly concerned with managing regulatory and investment risks in an era where increased investment in system infrastructure will be likely. Alternatively, energy efficiency, distributed energy, and environmental advocates maintain that the existing utility business model may be misaligned with certain clean energy public policy goals. Their concern is that this will limit the likelihood that such goals will be achieved. And finally, some state policymakers and regulators, for example in New York and, and Maryland, are considering new and oftentimes transformative approaches to elicit improvements in the operation and planning of the electric system by their distribution utilities. Much of the previous research in this area has really examined questions about potential misalignments between regulatory and utility business models in a desired future state of increasing customer adoption of distributed energy resources and declining sales due to effective enabling EE policies. In addition, prior research has posed more fundamental questions concerning just the viability of the current utility business model if such a future state does in fact come to reality. Now in contrast, we are focusing more attention on the link between regulatory and utility business models and the end goals of public policymakers, a topic that in our view has really received insufficient attention in the previous literature. Therefore, we're presenting a more holistic assessment and a consistent framework for depicting utility profit motivation and profit achievement aligned with public policy goals and customer technologies. It's our belief that this approach 
could be very useful to industry stakeholders in order to provide a lens through which to evaluate specific proposed changes to current practices. Additionally, the implications of changes to existing regulatory paradigms and business models should be included in assessing the viability of any newly proposed approaches. Next, I'm going to provide a brief background on cost of service regulation and introduce our framework that depicts how regulation incentives and motivates an investor-owned electric utility as a way to set up our subsequent discussion of how potential changes to the business model could better link to the end goals of policymakers in the future. Now, one of the primary roles of state utility commissions under cost of service regulation is to establish retail electricity rates for utility services. Now, in, in doing so, they really have to balance a number of different goals. Among them are stable revenues for the utility, stable retail rates for, cons for customers, efficient use of energy and capital, and retail rates that are fair, equitable, and understandable to customers. Now, the actual process for setting rates occurs through a formal administrative process called the general rate case. This process allows for regulators, utilities, and other interested stakeholders to establish fair and reasonable rate amounts that allow the utility to collect revenues, which will ultimately cover the utility's fixed and variable costs with an opportunity to earn a profit commensurate with that of, uh, earned by firms facing similar risks. Now, while the utility's authorized profits are set during these infrequent rate cases as a component of the ordered retail rate, a utility's actual profits between rate cases are simply the difference between its collected revenues and costs. This is similar to any other business. Now, under cost of service regulation, the utility has a clear incentive for cost control. Since its rates are set and remain intact between infrequent rate cases, the utility must keep cost growth under below revenue growth in order to see profits um, exceed authorized levels. Additionally, Utilities have an incentive to increase revenue growth between rate cases by promoting commodity sales between those rate cases. If electricity sales growth can outpace utility cost growth, then again, a utility can see profits in excess of authorized levels. However, if the reverse is true, if instead we see sales growth being limited or utility cost controls being unsuccessful, then the utility is going to see lower profits than anticipated. Now, cost of service regulation provides utilities with a return of and on capital investments. And this is their incentive to drive them towards building and maintaining a system that provides customers with reliable and affordable electric service. Now, this authorized profit is the product of the utility's equity portion of rate base and the authorized return on equity. This, the profit motivation for utilities, therefore, is really to build assets or grow rate base. And this is depicted on the bottom um, far left of the profit motivation spectrum. Some contend that because a utility's authorized return on equity is typically above their cost of capital, a utility may have an incentive to overinvest in capital compared to other inputs. Now, to counter this phenomenon, regulators could instead seek to focus a utility's attention on extracting the maximum value out of its existing set of assets through more efficient use of them. For example, a utility could rely on a customer's distributed generation system to improve the distribution system reliability in lieu of expanding or upgrading the distribution network itself. This alternative approach for motivating a utility is represented by the far right of the profit motivation spectrum at the bottom of the page. Now, while the utility's authorized profits are based on its rate base and authorized rate of return, again, a utility's actual profits are just purely the difference between collected revenues and incurred costs. Now, the largest component of collected revenues comes from volumetric sales. Thus, any decrease in commodity sales between rate cases due to, let's say, economic conditions, weather, or energy conservation programs will negatively impact utility profitability. Alternatively, any increase in commodity sales will have the reverse effect of improving utility profits. Now, this concept is referred to as the throughput incentive and is represented at the far left of the profit achievement spectrum located at the bottom of the slide. Regulators could instead redesign retail rates to focus exclusively on energy service delivery and not on commodity sales. Now, such an approach would incent the utility to increase profits through greater provision 
of these value-added services to customers instead of promoting increased sales. This would be represented at the far right end of the profit achievement spectrum, again, at the bottom of the slide. Now, when our profit motivation and profit achievement spectrums are actually taken together, we can create a simple and elegant framework for exploring movements from the traditional cost of service model to other models that promote greater service provision or greater extraction of value from existing assets. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Thanks, Pete. So our characterization of traditional cost of service regulation up to this point serves as a conceptual foundation for the framework. But in reality, the past century of utility regulation has resulted in a patchwork of changes to better align utility profitability with different policies and technologies. Incremental changes to cost of service regulation have addressed specific challenges to the utility industry. For example, volatile fuel prices and major cost overruns for large capital projects. There are numerous what we consider rate-making alternatives that could be considered incremental changes ranging from mechanisms for more timely recovery of fuel costs and capital expenditure costs to bill riders or trackers that recover costs associated with particular projects or programs, and even to broader alternative regulatory approaches like forward test years. We limit our discussion in this section of incremental changes to those rate-making alternatives that address profit motivation and profit achievement in the present environment of low load growth and inc increasing penetration of distributed energy resources. As Pete discussed earlier, profit achievement for electric utilities between rate cases is driven largely by revenue collection based on volumetric commodity sales and demand. Uh, the figure in this slide shows the proportion of a typical residential utility bill based on a sample of southwestern and northeastern uh, electric utilities. So you can see in the figure, the portion of revenues collected via a fixed charge on a residential customer's bill ranges from less than 2% to almost 20%. This results in the volumetric consumption driving the vast majority of the residential customer's bill, or 80 to 98%. As distributed energy resources are introduced, they will generally reduce the volume of the utility's electricity sales. For example, energy efficiency results in lower levels of electricity consumption, but without commensurate reductions in costs. That, in turn, reduces the utility's collected revenues and achieved profits, resulting in what we call a revenue erosion effect. Customer-sided generation reduces utility sales and impacts utility profit achievement in a similar fashion. This reduction in collected revenues is especially pronounced between rate cases when the retail rate is fixed. Rate-making mechanisms to address profit achievement are intended to make the utility indifferent to resources that negatively impact revenue collection between rate cases. Such rate-making approaches better align utility business models with public policy goals for increased efficiency and distributed energy resource deployments. As the utility is no longer incented to oppose such clean energy public policy goals. But it's important to note that the approaches do not necessarily incent the utility to achieve clean energy public policy goals. A variety of mechanisms exist today to address the revenue erosion effect, including rate designs that rely on a higher proportion of revenues collected by a fixed or demand charges compensating the utility for lost revenues with lost revenue adjustment mechanisms, and breaking the link between levels of commodity sales and collected revenues with forms of revenue decoupling. These rate-making alternatives were introduced several decades ago as a way to mitigate the real or potential negative uh, financial impacts from energy efficiency, and they continue to be pursued today as distributed energy resource penetrations increase. Incremental changes to rate making move the utility's profit achievement upwards in our conceptual framework, but we don't consider the changes significant enough to fundamentally shift earnings on incremental investments from volumetric commodity sales to provision of services. For regulated electric utilities, profit motivation is largely driven by investing in assets like generating plants and transmission and distribution systems. Today's electric utility industry is a capital-intensive industry predicated on central station generation with large delivery systems to transport the electricity to customers. A proportion of a utility's capital expenditures are growth-related because they're driven by increasing demands and new customers in its service territory. Customer investments in efficiency and distributed generation 
reduce that growth-related proportion of capital expenditures. Under these conditions, the utility is limited to only incremental capital expenditures for replacing aging infrastructure or to meet new system requirements not associated with increasing loads. Distributed energy resources, therefore, impact utility profit motivation by reducing the opportunities for the utility to invest in assets, what we call the lost future earnings opportunity effect. While decoupling and other similar mechanisms are intended to address the revenue erosion effect, there are separate mechanisms intended to mitigate the lost earnings opportunity effect. For example, targeted shareholder incentives can provide positive earnings opportunities for the utility's achievement of energy savings and other clean energy public policy goals that may stand counter to a traditional utility business model. Shareholder incentive mechanisms can be designed in numerous ways, and they've been used for several decades to provide financial rewards for the successful achievement of energy savings goals. These mechanisms typically fall into three general categories noted here in the slides, and we detail them more in the report. Any of these shareholder incentive mechanism designs could be applied more broadly to utility-administered distributed energy resource programs. Shareholder incentive mechanisms, as an example, are intended to incent utilities to achieve clean energy public policy goals. Such changes to the utility's regulatory model reflect a profit motivation based on a combination of assets and extraction of value from those assets, but do not represent a fundamental change to motivate regulated utilities towards profits based predominantly or exclusively on value extraction from existing and new assets. For the purposes of our framework, we place the rate making mechanisms that I just described as incremental changes in a single quadrant, quadrant three, bounded by profit motivation dominantly through assets and profit achievement dominantly through commodity sales. Anecdotal experience with these sorts of rate making mechanisms in the context of customer funded efficiency programs shows they can be effective in delivering benefits to ratepayers. Of the top 15 states in the 2014 ACEEE scorecard, 13 of those states have either a lost revenue recovery or shareholder and mechanism in place, or both. These incremental changes to traditional cost of service regulation are often made by regulators and policymakers in isolation to address either a particular policy, for example, an energy efficiency resource standard, or a particular utility investment, for example, advanced metering infrastructure. And they may be applied by layering various mechanisms. However, these changes are not, in our framework, comprehensive enough as to make distributed energy resources and achievement of clean energy public policy goals a core function of the utility. A more holistic and integrated approach by regulators may be necessary to make clean energy public policy goals complementary rather than in competition with the utility's profit motivation and profit achievement. We're now going to use our framework to characterize what we consider to be more fundamental changes in profit motivation and profit achievement to align with clean energy public policy goals. I'll discuss the placement of these more fundamental changes within the framework and potential regulatory and policy implications. If regulators want utilities to increasingly play a role in delivering value-added services like energy efficiency programs, energy storage programs, and home automation, regulatory and utility business models are likely to link and tie utility profits to services provision. Under such a situation, the utility would still likely be motivated to invest in new capital investments or assets. However, the particular capital investments would be made to drive increased delivery and enablement of utility or third-party services, which will generate larger achieved profit. Regulatory uh, business models focused on the utilities providing services rather than selling a commodity are largely conceptual at this point. However, there are some proposals emerging for distribution system operators that would potentially change the role of the incumbent electric utilities and fit within quadrant two of our framework. The model suggests a different set of roles than the traditional utility and may require alternative approaches for how the utility recovers revenues. And importantly, aligning utility profit achievement with clean energy public policy goals does not necessarily result in meeting those goals. Therefore, we think utility regulators are going to continue to play an important role in monitoring performance and enforcing compliance. Among the fundamental issues regulators must address when evaluating the utility's role in providing value-added services 
are the impacts on competitive markets for those services, and the risks to ratepayers of expanding utility investments into new areas. As an alternative to direct competition, utilities may partner with third parties to provide value-added services to customers. This is currently used in some parts of the country for energy efficiency programs. Utilities will face new risks as they move planning and operational functions towards delivering and providing particular value-added services. Customers may face new risks from needing to manage electricity consumption in different ways, including choosing between utility and third-party providers for desired services. Additionally, paying separately for energy services may change customer decision-making and the customer ep economics impacting adoption of distributed energy resources. And while increased competition for services may lower prices, the increased choices may pose additional risks for customers, especially in underdeveloped services. Utility revenue for value-added services in the future may be based on such metrics as lumens of light, heat delivered for hot water service, and the size of a solar PV system installed at the customer site. This would explicitly allow the utility to move away from focusing on selling more of the input, for example, electricity, in order to focus on selling more of the output, for example, lumens of light. Such pricing is common in other industries, including telecommunications, for example, as some mobile phone carriers charge for phone, text messaging, and data services separately instead of charging a flat rate. Traditional cost of service regulation motivates a utility to expend capital to solve a problem, for example, to meet new customer loads by building a new substation not necessarily to maximizing the value it can extract from existing assets to solve that problem. For example, optimizing distributed energy resources and utility energy efficiency programs to reduce or shift loads to avoid building a new distribution substation. One way that regulators can shift the profit motivation more towards value is by linking the utility's earnings to achievement of pre-established targets and goals. These more fundamental changes to utility profit motivation moves the utility along the spectrum where the utility's profits are largely, if not exclusively, based on targets and goals set by regulators, and the utility is motivated to maximize the value it extracts from existing assets. Incremental capital investments are still made, but made to meet or exceed targets and goals, not drive overall authorized profit levels. Performance-based regulation is a form of incentive regulation in which a utility's revenues are tied directly to performance and fit within Quadrant 4 of our framework. PBR mechanisms may be targeted with incentives limited to specific aspects of utility performance like fuel purchases or power plant performance, or they may be comprehensive in which PBR covers all aspects of the utility's rates or revenues. Several key elements for implementation of a comprehensive PBR approach include long-term plans and lengthy cycles for resetting rates, as well as pricing mechanisms that include flexibility to adjust to cost increases or other exigent circumstances between rate cases. Some view PBR to be a preferable regulatory model than cost of service regulation in terms of economic efficiency because it provides greater or stronger incentives for cost containment and innovation. This viewpoint is largely predicated on the belief that targets and goals, in other words, outputs, drive a firm's behavior better than an accounting framework focused on costs, in other words, the inputs. PBR does not necessarily suggest a change in the utility roles, although it is possible that regulators could use the opportunity of goal setting to reassess roles and responsibilities. From the perspective of the utility, risk of financial performance would be different under PBR. Profit risk for the utility under PBR is contingent on meeting goals, which drives revenue, in contrast to simply the level of sales. It is possible that the utility would be better able to manage risks since it would know whether or not it would be on track for meeting targets and goals, and such foresight may be more predictable than revenues driven by sales fluctuations. But there's been limited experience with comprehensive PBR approaches in the United States though there are many and more recent examples of targeted PBR mechanisms focused on particular areas of utility operations. Experience with more comprehensive PBR may be drawn internationally, most notably from Great Britain's RIO model. Building on and ultimately combining the previously identified fundamental changes results in a services and value-driven utility where profit motivation is based more on value than assets and profit achievement is based more on services than commodity. 
This fundamental and comprehensive change may result in the utility competitively or exclusively offering value-added services under a PBR-like model. This approach may present a complete paradigm shift in the way utilities are regulated, what a utility offers to customers, particularly behind the meter, and how a utility measures the services it provides to customers. Such a regulatory and utility business model within this upper right quadrant of our framework also requires a fundamental shift in pricing away from commodity sales and towards services offered, for example, dollar per kWh of solar generated electricity. Regulatory and utility business models within this quadrant of the framework are largely conceptual at present. However, in New York in 2014, the Department of Public Service commenced a proceeding to fundamentally change the roles and responsibilities of the distribution utility in order to become a manager of the distributed system platform. This may be the first example in the U.S. of such a comprehensive change that includes aspects of performance-based regulation and the competitive delivery of a variety of value-added services. And now I'll move to our conclusions and areas for future research. So the pace of distributed energy resource adoption will continue to vary by region in the U.S., driven by such factors as retail rates, installed technology costs, customer preferences, and policy frameworks. Regulatory models will also continue to vary by state, largely dependent on electric industry market structure and associated asset ownership, as well as history and experience with rate-making approaches and policy decisions in the state. The past may be a helpful predictor of changes to the regulatory paradigm. So for example, states that have embraced decoupling may tend to move more quickly to innovative regulatory models that facilitate greater utility service offerings. On the other hand, states that have had poor experience to date with shareholder incentives for energy efficiency may be more cautious about performance-based rate making. States' disparate experiences and market structures will continue to drive the diverse set of approaches we have in the U.S. today. We think that effective transition strategies can, halt, can also help mitigate the risks to utility shareholders, customers, and third-party providers of distributed energy resource services, and also facilitate achievement of clean energy public policy goals. Some key issues that should be considered as part of the transition strategies include market structure and asset ownership, planning and operational responsibilities, utility roles in providing these value-added services, the openness of utility networks, regulatory processes, leveraging past experience, and assessing and ensuring customer benefits. These and other issues are detailed more in the report, and we can talk more about during the Q&A. So many state policymakers and regulators are keenly interested in quantitative analysis of potential future impacts of distributed energy resources on utilities and customers. These impacts are dependent on various conditions, including market structure, the regulatory environment, state and federal policy goals, and rate design. Of particular interest to states are the combined effects of a suite of distributed energy technologies and multiple policies on costs, benefits, and risks for utilities and customers. LBNL has developed and applied a financial analysis tool over the past eight years to explore the quantitative impacts of energy efficiency and distributed resources on utility profits and customer rates and bills. This tool will be used over the course of the next year to look at combined impacts of clean energy policies and technologies and with more detail of customer-specific impacts. In addition to LBNL's quantitative research in this area, we are commissioning a series of concept papers qualitatively examining issues related to incremental and fundamental changes with funding from DOE's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. The first concept in the papers have been identified, and you can see them here on the slide. Many are underway with expected publication this fall or winter. So with that, that concludes the portion of the presentation, and we'll invite Q&A. As Pete mentioned, um, all lines are muted, and we're doing Q&A through the chat uh, function, which is on the left-hand side of the screen.